Hi, everyone. Today, we are going to speak with Irina Framkin. She is the Group Engineering Manager in Office 365. Irina, welcome. So tell me first uh, what you do in Office 365 because it's, it's a big product group. Yeah. Um, and first of all, thank you so much for having me here, Rafat. Super exciting. Um, so I'm a group engineering manager um, in the customer success engineering organization. And, you know, everything that we do, the reason Microsoft business is alive is because of our customers. Mm -hmm. And so it's super, super critical that customers can adapt, find success and find happiness with Microsoft 365 products. Um, and, and that's kind of the goal of the customer success engineering organization and being really, really customer driven. And I think like Microsoft has gone through a transformation, at least my experience there over 18 years, because when I first joined Microsoft out of college 18 years ago, I found myself on teams where some leader high up will come up with this vision for a project, right? And, and the whole team would work a year or two to build this project. And then I found we would release it to our customers and find that the customers are not achieving success with it, right? And, and, and so, and so, you know, it's just so much time spent and, and this is, has been the transformation over so many years because now we have this mindset of running experiments and getting features in front of customers using the agile lean startup model and using data, listening to our customers, learning their intents and, and, and running tests to determine that what we're doing is really ensuring they achieve success with our products. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's this big transformation um, that, that I've seen and, and um, it, it results in better products for our customers that enables them to achieve more. And so, and so within my team, I, um, I drive several work streams um, around um, human cloud experience, experiences, um, I'm driving a partner benefits program, the engineering effort there and um, a COGS reduction and an M365 growth effort. But really everything that we do is, is really customer driven and based on signal from our customers. Um, and so it's, 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 it's been a really fun journey and, and I love it very much. True, true. And as you said, Microsoft did change a lot for last few years. I remember a few years back when I was in uh, Windows Server and I never heard about customer. They cannot come to dev. It's so far away we sit from the customer uh, because you know they will go to support, tier one, tier two, all that. And very rarely they come, but this change I start seeing uh, uh, from Windows Server itself, we started, as a dev, dev team started talking directly to customer. And that was a huge change. And then I joined Cosmos DB. It was completely a different level altogether. Every customer used to have even our phone number, which was unheard in Microsoft. And, and the success of the product was because of that. So much focus on customer. So that's very good to uh, hear. Uh, so you said you completed almost 18 years in Microsoft. So what are product you worked on? Ooh, um, many, many products. So I started off in MSN Mobile, and then I went to Microsoft Research, and I worked on a photography application. And then I worked in Fuse Labs, building the future of social experiences and incubations for our customers. And then I moved into Xbox mm -hmm. and um, worked in Windows Gaming and Xbox and built out a big distributed system on Azure. Um, and I worked in Bing Ads for a little bit where I became a manager and got to work for my amazing mentor and learn from her on how to become the best possible manager because she's awesome. Mm -hmm. And then I came back into um, Windows and Universal Store um, 
to, to work on a distributed monitoring and diagnostic system, um, which we got reworked into Azure Pi. And, and then two years ago, I, I thought I really, really want to be closer to our customers and learn about the business. And so I moved into the customer success engineering org. And it's been so much fun um, learning more here about our business and customers. Cool, cool. So I don't know, as I was telling you, your name popped out in LinkedIn. Yes, we worked together long, long time back in Xbox. But your name popped out because you posted an article from HBR about team culture. So my first question is to you is, what do you mean by culture? And what is bad culture? And what is good culture? Yeah, that's a really great question. Culture, I think, is everything. It's that magic force that, that enables a team to be the best they can be, to deliver on amazing business results, achieve the impossible and build great products for our customers. And, and you know, during my 18 years at Microsoft, I've been on those teams and lived through those special moments where the culture was amazing, where my manager empowered me to grow, to learn, to work boundaryless and achieve on best possible results. And I worked super hard and I wanted to work hard. I, I would come to work every day. I would wake up motivated. I, I, I would have fun. I would enjoy myself. And, and then I've been in a couple of instances within teams with very toxic culture where I remember even at one point, I was so stressed out and I was so unhappy where it impacted me and my blood tests came back abnormal and I had to um, go to a doctor and, 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 and get medicine for anxiety. And, and oh that's kind of like just this example of a, a really, really bad culture. And, and, you know, when I think about this is like, we are all in the people business, but the developers, on our teams, they have many options, right? Yep. They get many pings from recruiters all over and there's nothing keeping them here, right? They can, you know, when I think about it in, in, in Redmond at Microsoft, we always say they can go across the bridge um, and, and, you know, get probably maybe a higher paying job, maybe a bigger title, right? Um, and so what, what keeps them there? What keeps them within the team? I think it's, right. it's the team culture. And mm -hmm. so my job every day as a manager is to build the best possible culture for my team mm -hmm. to ensure that they can achieve their best work, can grow and learn and, and just have a lot of fun doing it. I think of my team as my family uh, when we have so much fun together. True. So, Irina, you talked about a good culture. So what I would like to know, what all you can do to you know, foster a good culture in a company? So if any manager is listening to us, can you give him some tips for his team? What all those things we should go and do to have a healthy culture in my company? Yeah, and I want to kind of take a step back and, and, and kind of have us think about this question. Why do people work, right? Mm -hmm. And there are some indirect motives like people may come to work because of economic pressures, right? They need to, um, as, as in you, right, provide food for their family, provide housing and, and so on. And, and there's sometimes emotional pressures, right? Like they have to come to work, they have to stay on this team. And, and then there's other direct motives like to grow, to create impact, to learn, to achieve your best and to have fun, right? And, and if I look at some of the indirect motives, what happens is, and I was just talking to my girlfriend about this is, 
she comes to work to get her paycheck and her work is not her hobby. Mm. She comes in and she waits till the day is over, till she can go home. And then her hobbies begin, right? And so she just needs to get to that paycheck and go home, right? And we were discussing with her, like, you know, why is that, right? And and, and what could change in, in, in her environment or maybe if she could find another job. And so, and so, you know, if we focus on the direct motives, right? Where work becomes your hobby, mm-hmm. where you're, you're enjoying it, where you're having fun, where you're learning, you're growing, right? Every person is different. Some people get motivated by money. Some people are motivated by having impact on um, customers all over the world, right? Some people want to learn and grow or achieve that title, right? And so, and so if you're, if the environment focuses on each individual person in the organization and finds how to enable them to achieve their motives so that they, they know there's a Dale Carnegie principle and, and, and I've taken Dale Carnegie training, shout out to Nikki, it's, she's a great instructor. You know, when we think about every person, what's in it for them? And it's our jobs as managers creating that environment where every individual can can achieve the best they can be, can achieve their dreams, can achieve their growth, their goals, um, and 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 really have fun doing it. And that's what I think of, you know, that great culture. And there's no like silver bullet to it. It's not a one size fits all. It's different from every team, but it means as a manager to really growing and learning and listening and rethinking and 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 admitting failure um and and just you know actioning on feedback and really getting that feedback to cultivate that key environment true true i think yeah intrinsic motivation of a person drives a lot in a team uh, so you gave a good example of your friend who's she's uh, not completely invested in the day job because she had some other hobby, but she has to get a paycheck. She comes here and does that. I'm just wondering if you find somebody who is uh, not fully motivated or fully engaged, what you can do to motivate someone to bring their A game in the team? Yeah, that's a really great question. and I think it's it's not assuming, right? Because I have assumed in the past. I've assumed that people are like me and I'm super driven and I work really, really hard um, and work long hours. And, and, you know, sometimes I would assume people will want certain things and then I would fail and be really wrong. And so I think it's really taking time to listen to the person and ask a lot of probing questions. Like, you know, are they ha- are they happy? What, where do they want to be in their career in a year or three years? Are, are they enjoying their projects? What's, what's motivating them, right? And, and, you know, probably several other questions. And, and, and then just getting that perspective on really the person and what are their motivators and what, what they want from their career. Or it, it, in some cases, it could be, they may want, you know, they may not want to grow and get to the next level, right? They, they may want great work-life balance and, you know, they may want to spend a lot of time with their family, right? So, so that's really important. Or, or maybe they, they may want to um, help the homeless or do some um, work to, to help, to help um, the, the, the global good, um, and so, and every person is different and you just can't assume. So you really have to sit down and talk to them and really, really listen and try different things. Like in one of my teams, I had um, a person who I thought I found the most perfect project for them, but that project wasn't leveraging their strengths and and they weren't really enjoying it. And so 
and so they ended up leaving my team, right? Um, and, and, and I failed to listen to them. I failed to ask those probing questions, right? And so, you know, it's, it's not one size fits all. It's, mm. it's listening and really um, understanding each person and creating a very customized plan for them. Right, true. And sometimes people may not be a right fit for the team, the work you're doing. And if somebody wants to work in assembly language, and if you put him on <laughs> designing a website, it may not be a right fit for him. So that's true. Yeah. So uh, I don't know. I want to ask you another question because uh, of your journey. You've been dev for a long time, dev lead, dev manager, and now you are a group manager. Um, so I would like to get uh, some tips from you for people who are getting into dev lead position. And then their second part of the question is, what things they should change about themselves when they become from dev to dev lead and when they become dev manager, because these two steps are very different. And I see in my personal experience, you flutter a lot when you are just promoted from one position to another. Uh, so I would like to hear some tips from you for dev lead and for dev manager, what things they should change about themselves, what the things they should focus on basically how they can be successful in these new position. Yeah, um, that's a great question. You know, I'll reflect back on many years ago when I went from an individual contributor to a dev lead. And man, did I make many mistakes. So my hope is maybe you can learn from my mistakes. So um, I... When I was an individual contributor, I could always count on myself to deliver on best possible results. I knew that if I worked late nights or if I worked over the weekend, or if I just, you know, put all my heart into it, I'll deliver, right? And, and going from that to a dev lead position, I wasn't, I could no longer rely on myself only to deliver, right? Because my charter increased, right? So, mm -hmm. so now I had to find ways I can leverage my team to deliver. And, and this was really, really hard, right? Like I, um, at first I didn't know which tasks to give to what people, right? I didn't know what their strengths or weaknesses were. So I, I, I gave tasks and I trusted people with critical tasks that they didn't, you know, have the skills or strengths to achieve. So, you know, the principle that I learned was trust, but verify, right? And having those regular check-ins and, mm -hmm. and, and, and getting feedback and rethinking, right? And, and so then, when at some point there, there was that moment where I trusted this, this um, individual on my team to deliver on results and he didn't deliver. So what did I do after that? I took over that project myself. I locked myself in my office and I worked around the clock to deliver on that project and I delivered it, right? The schedule was delayed. I delivered it, but it sent the wrong message to my team because they felt like I didn't trust them to help me. And mm. so that was, I think, a really, really big failure, right? Really, and, that's and, a and, very big learning. And I think a lot of new dev leads make that mistake that let me just do it because, you know, I'm one of the good devs and that's why you're promoted. So that's very good learning. Thank you for sharing that. So uh, yeah, continue on if, more things if you want to add for dev lead and yeah. what he will do for dev managers. So, and, 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 you know, your, I think your job when you become a manager is to get yourself out of a job. Mm. It's, it's, it's to grow future leaders, developers, um, so that they can take over your job and you can go and, and, and find um, other opportunities. And, and I remember I went to my mentor, um, one of my mentors, Vanessa, and you know, one of the things she told me was like, 
Hey, Irina, when you go on vacation and you leave your kids with your parents, you, you trust that they're going to be okay, right? And when, when that next role comes up, you have to ensure that your team is going to be okay, that they can do their, your job. And so, and so you can't become this dependency, right? And you know, the mm. other mistake I would make is I would really closely micromanage, mm. right? And, and so they would have to just like ask me everything. Irina, is it okay if I do this? Irina, is it okay if I do that, right? And they were so dependent on me at first where I wasn't even giving them ability to think for themselves. And that was a huge, huge failure. And so, and so, you know, I think, you know, those, those learnings and, and then when you move from a dev lead where you're closely managing a project and, and, and growing and managing um, individual contributors to, to a manager, your job is now becomes growing future leaders, mm. right? And, and like micromanaging just goes out of the window because, because you really want to empower them to, to achieve their best work, but also create the right team processes and, 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 and architecture and drive their project. But I think the other really big thing is, and I strongly believe in growth mindset, is finding opportunities where they're challenged and where in cases they may fail, but, but failure is how they grow, right? Mm -hmm. And so and so really becoming even more hands off. And right. and I think and I think as a manager, you know, you want to create the clarity for them, but just enable them to achieve results in their own special way. True. And that that I think is very critical. True, true. Good, very good, uh, very good points. I'll just summarize. So first thing I think I learned from you that if you have a team first find out their strength and weakness, because when you start giving work, you have to be certain uh, who you are giving and whether he's ready or not, is he prepared, does he need training and things like that. And, and then have, uh, you know, very scheduled check-ins with them to find out their progress. And then don't try to do work yourself. That was your second learning. And um, third one was uh, don't micromanage. That's, that's very important. And it's very difficult for some people to let go. And when you become manager of managers, it's really very important for you to be hands off and, and set up the processes and all. So good, good tips. Thank you. Uh, so uh, now I know you are, you know, running an engineering organization, you have a pretty big team. So I want to know what are the engineering best practices you follow as such? Because you just told us that you are responsible for multiple work streams and how and everything has to be get done. There's, there's no uh, chance for you to miss any of the deadlines. So what are the best engineering practices you put in place and how you're running your engineering organization, if you can talk a little bit about it? Yeah, and I think, you know, the, the three kind of principles that I learned at Microsoft is create clarity, generate energy, and deliver on results, mm. right? And so, you know, when people think about engineering practices, they think about um, how do how do people write their best code? Um, testing and is your code performant and and does it achieve what it needs to achieve? And I think there's just much much more than that, right? Because ultimately we are in the people business, and I think I mentioned that before. And so putting those practices in place. Um, to, to cultivate that culture and that environment and that operating system that enables the team to deliver on the results. So first I'd like to start with creating clarity and creating clarity can't be top down, right? Mm -hmm. if, if I go to my team and say, you must do this or else you're not gonna get your promotion or you're gonna get bad reviews, right? That's just not gonna work, right? Mm -hmm. so, so I feel like creating clarity has to be that team effort, right? And, and, and some of the ways we do this is 
we we have brainstorming sessions and we work on an engineering memo together um and and and, and also being really customer driven like in some cases we've talked to some of our customers or um or, or looked at customer metrics but at the end of the day Every developer needs to know why they're doing something, what's in it for the customers and what's in it for them. And that's mm -hmm. where I think it's super, super critical to create that clarity. And, and you know, I, I have the, my favorite book, The Five Dysfunctions of a Team. Yes. Um, yes. And I love this book. And, and, you know, the key about creating clarity is you want to have an environment of trust but you also want to promote conflict, right? You want to promote an environment where people can speak up and disagree with you, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and most of the time, like I tell my team, I'm wrong, so challenge me, right? I want to hear your diverse you know, opinions and, and that's what's going to you know, enable us to create that accountability mm -hmm. and, and to create that clarity. The second piece is, is generate energy. And this is where, like, I take on this role of, like, a cheerleader, right? Um, and, like, we have um, dev team meetings where people demo their work, right? We have um, once a month we do, like, thank yous. So, um, so everybody in a team's chat gets to type in thank yous to other folks on the team who've helped them, right? And so, and so it, it's like, it's like um, you know, generating that energy, let's go, let's deliver amazing results for our customers, and then recognizing everyone's achievements as they make those baby steps, mm -hmm. right? And, and then the third piece is it's really about delivering results. And that's really, really important. At the end of the day, we're nowhere without our results. So we use OKRs um, to, to set up those clear, clear um, goals and measurable um, outcomes. And, and, and we drive towards them. And so we follow like the, an agile process. We have backlog grooming, sprint planning. We have um, stand-ups across the team. But one of the other things I learned is is, and, and this was another failure I had, is you, you can't just take a certain process and apply it to the team. Like one size does not fit all. And so every one of my teams runs a little bit differently. And that's okay because it's it's the piece that, that works for them. And so I find if you enable leaders on your team to create the best engineering process, with with others, then it's going to work best for them. And then the last piece I think is really important is having retrospectives and feedback sessions, L learning what's working, what's not working, and what's not working. It's you know time to rethink, and that's I think super super important to be constantly rethinking things, whether it's looking at metrics or experiment results to adjust what we're building for our customers or moving people around from different projects, right? We have this program called Talent Mobility in the Customer Success Engineering Organization where every individual, if, if they feel like they're, they're not happy with their project, they can go and, and, and uh, move teams and work on something else without even having to require an interview if they're like in, in decent standings, right? So that's, right. I think, is super critical. Right. Perfect. So clarity, when you say clarity, that's something I'm struggling even in my present company because we are building so many products and we do have, you know, product owners as such. But that's one of the most difficult piece I feel to get the clarity for the team. So do you do anything special there? Like do you write BRD? Do you write functional spec? Do you have mock-up screen? how you bring the clarity in the team about a product. Yeah, and like, look, by the way, um, just disclaimer, everything that I tell you today, like apply your own fit, 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 uh, filter because I could be totally wrong, right? And so and so, like, I don't know if, if, if what we're doing is, is the best possible thing, but I think in terms of creating clarity, um, it's like 
if I look at one of my work streams, the human cloud experiences work stream, um, it started off as an incubation effort, right? Where we were just running many experiments, right? Um, and, and using data and, and customer feedback to figure out what we're gonna go and do. And so in this case, creating clarity wasn't just some leader writing a white paper and imposing this is what we're gonna do. It was really about using data and customer signal to, to ensure that that clarity is customer driven in mm -hmm. regards to the next steps, right? In some cases, you have to really look at the business and the TM, like the, the, the total addressable market and, and what others are doing in the space, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, and it's also looking at data to come up with those key OKRs, right? Mm -hmm. that, that are achievable, but also really, really challenging. And so if I would say like, I'm working on this, I'm not the best at it. <laughs> But, but we're working through it. And, and, you know, and then the last thing about creating clarity is addressing the whys, right? Because every developer wants to know yes. why are we doing it? Right. And sometimes it's really about what's in it for them. Sure. Uh, and that's super important to create that clarity in one-on-ones with, with every engineer. And, and you know, and we, recently we were just doing this document um, that, that we're going through in our one-on-ones just to figure out each individual, what motivates them, what drives them, what do they want to achieve from their careers. And that's super, super important piece of the clarity because even if you produce a customer-driven memo, if a person doesn't realize what's in it for them, they're right. not going to be motivated to, to deliver on great results. So I think that's, that's an important piece. Right, right. Perfect. Get the clarity for the team, generate the energy, and then OKR, have result-driven uh, outcomes. And we should be properly defined in OKR. Uh, so, yep, this is, this is good, good, good tips. Now... My next question is, uh, as GM for uh, this position, you must be hiring a lot of people. And you generally do interview for an hour. And sometimes you're hiring somebody, you know, very senior management position. So how in one hour you judge a person? So basically what I'm asking is, what all things you look in a candidate? to be hired by you? Yeah, that's a really great question. And I recently got to um, hire, build up a team in Atlanta. So so this is kind of, you know, close to heart. And, um, mm -hmm. and I got to um, hire a leader there. Um, and, you know, when I think about hiring that leader, and by the way, this really kept me up at night because I wanted to find a person who would create that culture that that enables everybody on the team to have fun to grow to achieve the best results and so i was taking time like taking that job super super seriously right um and and most of all I wasn't looking to hire a person that has the best data structures or algorithms knowledge or can do recursive problems. I was really looking for that great person, number one. And, and the things that were really important to me is, is, is this person a learner? Do they exhibit growth mindset? Mm. Do they show empathy and really, truly, truly care about people? Um, do, do they have the skills to work boundaryless across Microsoft to deliver on results? Because everything we do is not just heroics of one team. It's, it's together with the rest of the company. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that was really important to me. And, and, you know, everything else was secondary. Of course, we wanted to check systems thinking and technical and algorithms and, you know, data structures, knowledge, that was really important, but like. The, the, the finding that great leader was crucial. And, and I did like, I hired Pablo and he's just like fantastic. Like he's, he's been able to jump in and getting really positive feedback from his team. And he's just 
creating that amazing culture. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that I think is, is, is really important. Um, the other thing to say is, um, like when you interview people, right? And I've seen ways done wrong, right? I heard one engineering manager say at Microsoft, I pick a set of problems, like, can you, you know, traverse the binary search tree or can you implement this recursive problem? And I ask every candidate and compare them against each other. No, you know, um, because when I think about, about this is, every person is different. They have their strengths, they have their weaknesses, they have diverse background and, and diverse skills. And, and when you interview them, you really wanna find what strengths do they bring to the table and diverse opinions and, and hire them for that. And so, you know, if you give a really amazing diverse leader or developer a, a standard recursive problem and only look at that, you're, you're not testing everything else. Um, mm-hmm. And then the other thing to note is hiring for diversity is because the only way we can succeed with our products is if we empower every individual on the planet to achieve success with them. And the note is every, not every customer is like me, right? In mm-hmm. fact, they're very different from me. And so, and so finding that team of diverse individuals that are different from me, um, to build those diverse products that customers love is just really, really critical. And, and so, and finding ways to, to test for that. And, and, and the third thing to add is, I was not looking to hire people like myself. I know mm. my strengths and I know many, many weaknesses that I have. And I wanted to find people who, who are my polar opposites so that we can have that diverse team to deliver on the best results. And that was very important to me. Right, right, right. So very interesting that you said initially uh, that this keeps you up in night because generally people who are going for interview, they are up in night, nervous that they have an interview, but you also take it so seriously. And I, I agree with you, especially when you're hiring somebody for a very senior position, it's a, it's a huge responsibility and your mistake can be very, very drastic for the company. And so a couple of things jumps out to me was one thing you said, it, he and she must have empathy and growth mindset. So these are the two key things is jumps out to me. And I think uh, people who are looking for a job, I think these are the two things they should make sure they have in them. Uh, growth mindset is, I think, one of the most important aspect of everything. So very good. Looking at you, it doesn't look like you ever failed. <laughs> and <laughs> so I want to know about your failures, which if you can share some of your failures, it can be personal or professional. And uh, the idea behind this, I want my audience to understand that people do fail in their journey. And it's just a you know temporary setback and how people come out of those failures. So if you can share something uh, which can be a learning uh, experience for us, uh, where you fail and what you learn from it and how did you came out of it? Yeah, and Rafat, I've had so many failures. Like I feel like I'm failing at something every day and I'm constantly analyzing it and thinking, how can I do better next time? How, what can I do differently? And so I was thinking, you know, thinking about, I have many failures, but one of the key things I learned, and this was over the last year, right? Because COVID is hard, right? Like I'm a people person and I love to go in the office and meet people and talk to people, right? And when I'm isolated by myself, I get very depressed. Um, and so, and so, you know, I was feeling really down. And um, I was lucky enough to have an executive coach um, to work with. And I thought she was going to help me achieve this project results or help me figure out how to work with this partner. But what she said was, "Hey, Irina, what do you do every day to take care of yourself?" 
Um, and, and, and like, what makes you happy, right? Because the thing that she made me learn was if you can't show up as your best self at work, if you're stressed, if you're not smiling, if, you know, all these factors where you're not well yourself, it's going to impact your team because we as leaders are constantly being watched. And so I learned this from her. And, you know, at one point I hit like this peak. I was depressed. I put on 20 pounds. I wasn't exercising. And I was just like, always down, right? Like, I just wasn't really happy. And and then there was this trigger, because on Facebook, I learned that this this girl who I went to high school with, um, who, who worked at Microsoft, and was this just beautiful, energetic human being took her life. And Mm -hmm. that hit me so hard because she was my age. And, and how could this happen? Right. And and Mm -hmm. then I was looking at myself and like, I wasn't doing well. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I just, I thought like, my failure was I wasn't really taking care of myself. Mm -hmm. And, and so I changed things around. Mm -hmm. I started um, a 14,000 steps a day challenge. And now I walk 14, it's about two and a half hours a day. Mm -hmm. Um, And that really helped me. I'm spending more time reaching out to family and friends. I am buying things because one thing that's important to me is sometimes buying shoes and clothes, right? Every, every person has their, their different thing for me. It's like, it's like buying that pair of shoes, right? Um, and, and, and then just really focusing on my well-being because that's the way I can bring my best self to work. And so I think the lesson I want to give to, um, to folks listening is most of all, take care of yourself, take care of your well-being, take care of your health mm-hmm. um, and, and, and find time for that. Because if you're well yourself, then only then you can bring your best self to work and to your team and to your customers and achieve great results. And so that was, yeah. I have many more failures to share. <laughs> okay. Good, good. Now this is this is good. By the way, I know I think uh, know you for more than almost ten years or so, and you have not changed a bit. The way I saw you ten years back, you are still like frozen in time. So just oh, so I know. love you, Rafa. Thank you so much. <laughs> no, seriously, exactly, uh, no change at all. So you talked about executive coach. And I think these are the perks of working in a you know good companies that you can afford these uh, things like an executive coach. And that reminded me of the most famous coach. His name is Marshall Goldsmith. And I was listening to his podcast and he's talking about that women, sometimes they work so hard that they forego their career. And like, you wonder what do you mean by that? And then he explained that women work so hard in the sense the job they have, they want to put 110% in that job and they will have no energy to look for their future or for the next level. And what happened because they are such good worker that they're given more work and more work and they basically just drown in the work. And so they forego their career for the job. So uh, very interesting observation. I didn't realize that till I heard him. I know that they do go extra mile, but uh, I would like to hear any comment from you, what you think uh, on his comment that women let go their careers for the job. You know, I think, thank you so much for sharing that with me. I think there's some truth to that, right? Work is a huge piece of my life. And, you know, I was an immigrant. I immigrated with my family from Ukraine. And I, back then I was an only child and um, my sister was born in, in US. And, and my parents kept telling me and my, and my grandma as well, cause she was a very important person in my life. Like, Irina, um, we came to America so that you can work really hard. 
and, 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 you know, have a great life. And so I put so much in my work um, and in the people in my team and projects. And sometimes I find myself working late at night and, you know, I rely often on my managers to put me up for that promotion or to recognize my results. Right. Mm -hmm. And also in the past, I haven't always like been as aggressive in moving teams because I'm just, you know, how could I leave my team? How can I leave my customers? How can I leave my project type of thing where there's other type of people, right. And, you know, I don't know if it's just specific to men, it could, you know, it's, you know, to different people who are always on the lookout for that next thing for their career, mm. who are constantly pinging and asking for that promotion, who makes strategic moves, right? And that's not me. And so, and so I think, you know, it's, it's, I really deeply rely on my manager and, and, and trust, trust him to really recognize my work. And, and I'm also super loyal, right? That's, 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 and I'm not going to go leave just because there's that extra career opportunity that's going to get me to that next level. Um, and so I think, I think there's, you know, there's some truth to it, Rapat. Truth to that. I agree yeah, with you. Yeah. Okay. So my next question is, Helena, the worst advice you heard in your life, which you look back and you say, man, that was a very worst management advice. Yeah. You know, Rafat, if you look at me, right, I'm not, I don't sometimes look at what people think as their typical developer. Mm -hmm. I like, I love bright clothing. I love shoes. I love makeup, red lipstick, lashes, right? And I'm a really, really bubbly, energetic person. I love to tell stories. It's, it's, it's who I am. And I was told once by, um, by a leader to change, to, to dress differently, to act differently, if I want people to take me seriously. Mm. And you know, I tried that. I tried like, it, even at one point, I let my uh, blonde hair, I mean, it's fake, but still grow out. And I tried wearing less makeup and, and um, even changing my clothes. And I was miserable. Like I was just just totally, totally miserable. And that was, I think, the worst possible advice because most of all, we have to be true to ourselves. True, true. And we have to, because if, if we try to change ourselves and become someone else and that conflicts with who we are, that's just terrible, right? So that was just the worst advice. So my learning is, you know, whoever, you know, you are, whoever, you know, your, your preferences and style, like just, be your authentic self True. and 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 people will you know respect you and 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 they'll uh, you know they'll learn to love you for who you are so that was just a terrible advice exactly uh, listening to that i was thinking it seems like it's a madman show i don't know if you've seen this show it's a 1960 of america showing you know madison <laughs> avenue uh, I have no culture idea. Uh, that's how they may be talking that time. I don't expect anybody to talk uh, or say or give this kind of advice in the modern time because, you know, this is what we mean by diversity. It's, it's, it's you know, all that. So, okay, this is interesting. Uh, <laughs> this is, I will say, yeah, one of the worst advice somebody give you that not to be yourself. Um, so now let's flip it. Same question. What is the best management advice you heard? Yeah, and, and I have many, but if I think of um, my mentor, Audrey, at one point she was like, Irina, you're really stressed. Smile, right? And, and you know, I think the, the best possible thing, like for, for an employee, right, they're walking through the hallway and they, they, they may, you know, they overthink things. Many people overthink things. And if a manager walks by and smiles for them um, and, and just says good job with something or remember something, that's, that's so important. We're constantly like we as leaders are constantly being watched. But the second aspect to that advice is Murphy's law, like 
things will happen and you have no control over it. Mm -hmm. And so at this, at this time of, you know, chaos, right. Um, you have to be as calm as, as you can be. Like, I remember my um, current manager, Jared, telling me once like, Hey, um, even the leaders of a SWAT team are calm and composed, right? Because as if we as leaders appear stressed, frustrated, sad, right? Our team gets stressed, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and like, that's, that's not a really good thing. And so smiling, being as composed and calm as possible. And um, I'm still learning this. I'm not perfect by any means because I show a lot of emotion. But I'm trying really hard to just, you know, be the best I can be for my team and bring energy and clarity in the best possible um, situations. Okay, perfect. So uh, now the last question I have, uh, would you like to recommend any books on management or any books how to improve yourself, uh, which helped you most? Yeah, and I have a couple. So there's a there's a book and you know, I, I was listening to this on audiobook. It was actually recommended by Satya in his book Hit Refresh, and it's about mindset mm -hmm. by Carol Dweck. And it talks about growth mindset, which is really, really critical um, because that's how we learn and grow. Um, mm -hmm. The second book is, and I already shared this, the five dysfunctions of a team. team. Yeah. Um, and then the third book, I have it right here, which I love is this anti-fragile book mm -hmm. by Nassim Nicholas mm -hmm. and um, things that gain from disorder. And I think in our constant landscape, um, you know, and just an example, like over last year, right, when COVID hit, we had to rethink many things and all these things went wrong, um, you know, and, and it is just, it's, it's super, it's super important to to be anti-fragile and um, and learn from um, experiences and have that growth mindset, but also try to create teams that can work with ambiguity, that can change, that can alter, because you could be hit by anything. And the same actually applies to distributed systems design, right? Because mm -hmm. anything can go wrong. And so how do you create those systems that anticipate and can not even anticipate, because sometimes like, you know, things can go wrong, you can't even anticipate, but adjust to disorder or to black swans. Um, right. So those, you know, those books I love, but I have been, and I do recommend the 14 K step challenge because walking two and a half hours a day, I discovered audible and I've just been listening to audiobooks um, right. and, and really, really enjoying them. So, so I highly recommend the walking challenge if anybody wants to do it. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you very much. I really appreciate you taking time to speak with us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rafat. Thank you so much for having me and for this opportunity to speak. I think for me, my job is, is super, super important to me and the impact I can have on customers, but also future leaders. So if anyone, you know, has any questions or just wants to chat, or if there's a way I can help you, um, do reach out to me on LinkedIn, Irina Frumkin, and I'd love to have um, a chat with you. Perfect, good. So thank you. Thank you again.